Hi everyone, thank you for joining our webinar today titled Introduction to Gas Adsorption, not Absorption. With me is John Guerin. He is our Key Account Business Development Manager. Um, he came to us with a wealth and years of experience in specifically surface area. And so it's definitely my pleasure to be introducing him. My name is Julie Chen Nguyen. I will be facilitating and monitoring questions and comments that you have in the background. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and pass the ball to you. Please go ahead and share your screen and the floor is yours. Thanks, Julie, very much. So I'd certainly like to personally welcome everyone to the webinar and thank you for taking the time to attend. I hope you find it interesting and informative by the time we finish with this. And as Julie said, and as you can see, I've uh, titled my presentation, Introduction to Gas Adsorption, or everything you ever wanted to know about physisorption, but were afraid to ask. So what is gas adsorption? Um, covering the basics right now, the adsorption is the accumulation of a substance at a surface of a material. Gas adsorption is the buildup of gas molecules on the surface of a solid, which is a reversible process, as we'll talk about further. And it's not to be confused with absorption, which is the accumulation and distribution of a substance throughout a material. Physical adsorption, or physisorption as it's frequently called, is another name for gas adsorption, and this is a reversible process. Chemical adsorption, or which is frequently called chemisorption, is a much higher energy, non-reversible adsorption or bonding of gas molecules on selected sites of a material primarily used for characterizing catalysts. So an example of this might be um, in um, oil refinery, a catalyst might be a platinum metal dispersed on the surface of an alumina support. If we were to do a physical adsorption experiment on that uh, sample, we could see total surface area. But if we were to do a chemical adsorption or chemisorption test on that material, we would bond gas molecules only to the platinum. So we could be able to determine the uh, platinum surface available for reaction in that catalytic reaction. So why is it important? It's important to the measurement and performance of many materials. Adsorption occurs in nature. Materials which separate gases, such as gas purification or gas separation, or even materials that are used in gas masks. Um, surface of active pharmaceutical ingredients and, and excipients, excuse me, the, have their performance affected by surface area and porosity. Activated carbons are used to adsorb impurities from water for purification. Paints, pigments, and coatings all require certain surface characteristics to perform optimally. And as I mentioned previously, oil refining by catalysts require specific surface design to be effective. So what causes a gas to adsorb? Well, van der Waals forces are weak intermolecular forces which um, increase as molecules become closer together. And within a material, these forces are satisfied by neighboring molecules of the substance. But at the edge or the interface of the material with surrounding gas or liquid, those van der Waals forces have nothing to satisfy them, There's no neighboring molecules on the surface. So a couple of definitions here. Um, adsorptive, um, as you see here, is the gas which is available to be adsorbed. Adsorbate is the gas which has been adsorbed to the surface and the adsorbent is the material itself doing the adsorption. So a little bit more about what's actually causing a gas to adsorb. In nature, at this interface or edge of the solid, these van der Waals forces attract water molecules or other vapors from the surrounding atmosphere. And by doing so, they satisfy the unmet potential energy at the surface. Now, flat surfaces are lower in adsorption energy and adsorption energy increases as pores become smaller. So imagine a gas molecule at a set distance um, my pointer being maybe a gas molecule from the, from the material. At the surface, as we develop more curvature or pore structure, 
there's a greater concentration of surface energy to interact with the gas molecule. So in this example, a flat surface, we'd likely to have a one-to-one -one interaction between the surface and the gas molecule. As we move to a surface that has more curvature, we might have several pieces, areas of the surface that are interacting. So a higher energy adsorption would take place. And again, you can see the same thing here, even higher energy adsorption, more surface reacting with this gas molecule. And finally, in a very small pore, if it was some distance above, there's a tremendous well of energy here uh, attracting that molecule in. So again, as the surface curvature increases and we go from flat to larger pores to smaller pores, the energy of adsorption increases. So again, some definitions, classifications. The International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, IUPAC, has defined these pore sizes and the ranges that apply to them. So macro pores, the largest pores, are from about 50 nanometers and larger in diameter. Mesopores are from about 2 to 50 nanometers, and micropores typically less than 2 nanometers in diameter. So generally, materials with larger pore sizes tend to have lower total surface area. Materials with smaller pore sizes alternatively tend to have much higher surface area. And of course, non-porous materials are lowest in surface area. What else causes a gas to adsorb? Well, in a gas adsorption experiment, the sample which has been placed in a sample holder and appropriately prepared, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, is immersed in a cryogen. It's typically liquid nitrogen. And that cools the surface of the sample, in the case of liquid nitrogen, to approximately 77.3 Kelvin. Gas, which is admitted to the sample holder, loses thermal energy as it in, in, enters that uh, cryogenic environment. And again, as a result of the surface energy of the material, the gas molecules adsorb. So this is kind of a simplification, if you will, of the adsorption process our little representation of a porous surface here. And at the, various at the very lowest pressures, isolated sites on the sample start to adsorb gas molecules. And then as the gas pressure increases, the adsorbed molecules increase to form what is called a monolayer, one uh, gas um, molecule thick throughout the surface of the material. Increasing the gas pressure further causes the beginning of what's called multi-layer adsorption or multi-layer coverage. Smaller pores might be filled first, and then what we will talk about later, the BET equation is used to calculate surface area in this range. And then as we further increase gas pressure, we cause pores to be completely filled, <clears throat> the whole sample be covered and pores completely filled. Now, what effect does particle size have on surface area? Well, imagine a non-porous flat surface cube, which is one centimeter on edge. So such a cube would measure six square centimeters in area, one centimeter times one centimeter times six faces. If we trisect that same cube into eight one-half by one-half centimeter cubes, it will actually create 12 square centimeters of area, one-half times one-half times six, 1.5. 1.5 times 8 cubes, 12 square centimeters. And continuing on, if we were to trisect those into one quarter centimeter by one quarter centimeter cubes, we would again double the surface area to 24 square centimeters. So as you can see, as particle size decreases, surface area increases quite substantially. So a few additional terms that we need to nail down. Um, the isotherm is the raw data from a test at constant temperature, again, typically 77.3 K for liquid nitrogen. And it's plotted as volume of gas adsorbed on a y-axis versus pressure on the x-axis. Saturation pressure is the pressure of a gas which is in equilibrium with its liquid, expressed as P0. Now, to measure saturation pressure, a sample tube is immersed in liquid nitrogen. Gas is admitted and allowed to build pressure. At some point, no further pressure can be maintained in the sample tube. This is due to the equivalent rates of condensation and evaporation in the tube. This establishes saturation pressure for this experiment. Again, this is, can be influenced by elevation, atmospheric conditions, 
the doer in which the liquid nitrogen is placed, the purity of the liquid nitrogen, excuse me, the liquid nitrogen, among other things. Relative pressure is a means to normalize data from different labs, which may be at differing atmospheric pressures, where the absolute pressure is divided by the saturation pressure of the test gas, frequently written as P divided by P0, and typically expressed as something like 0 0.05, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, etc. And you can think of that as 5% of saturation pressure, 10% or 20% of saturation pressure. So again, when we have different atmospheric conditions, by ratioing it to the saturation pressure in those conditions, we can then now compare data from lab to lab. For instance, a lab in the mountains of Colorado or somewhere in Europe in the Alps could compare data quite easily to a lab that's at sea level somewhere else in the world. Then desorption is the opposite of adsorption, the removal of the adsorbed gas from the surface of a substance. Now, I mentioned IUPAC before, the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. They have defined um, several types of isotherms, actually six with a couple of subtypes within them. Microporous materials are typically represented by what's called a type 1 isotherm, and there's a type 1A and a type 1B. What happens in these isotherms, and again, we have volume adsorbed on the y-axis and pressure on the x-axis. So as gas is adsorbed in micropores, again, very small pores, very high energy, and at extremely low pressures, those pores fill with gas, and we reach a point where no more adsorption takes place. So we have a very horizontal remainder of the isotherm here. And the main difference between a type 1A and a type 1B is a type 1B has a broader distribution of pore sizes um, in the micropore range. So you see a different slope here. But again, both cases we're adsorbing almost the entire surface at extremely low pressures due to these micropores. A non-porous or macroporous solid would exhibit a type 2 isotherm. So as I showed in my little graphic earlier, we build up gas molecules on the surface, and then we reach a point where we build up multi-layers of gas on the surface. Um, and then with a macroporous solid, as we reach higher and higher pressures, we start to fill those macropores, and you see uh, an increase in pressure, um, uh, in volume adsorbed, rather, on the pressure axis. Type three isotherms are very rarely seen. Um, essentially, this is a material that has no interaction, no affinity to adsorb the gas molecules. So nothing really takes place um, until we get to the point where we've increased the pressure so much over the sample that maybe a few gas molecules are adsorbing and then the energy of adsorption mostly is created by those gas molecules to additional gas molecules. Mesoporous solids, another type of isotherm, a type 4, and again, we have, again, we have a, a A and B version of this, but it's very similar to the type 2, where we have buildup of uh, gas on the surface, multi-layer adsorption occurs, but the difference here is we have mesopores, which are the intermediate pore size, versus macropores, which are the larger pore size here. So these pores fill at lower pressures as we're increasing pressure to saturation. And then typically they will, if when you're performing a desorption, follow a different path uh, on the isotherm plot as we desorb that gas. This hysteresis, as it's known, is indicative of pore shape information. In fact, I think IUPAC has at least four different classifications for hysteresis that um, give you information about pore shape. So for example, a poor throat and a poor cavity being different diameters would cause hysteresis to occur. And in type 4B, we have cylindrical closed-in pores or smaller mesopores, and they adsorb and desorb at essentially the same pressure. Finally, the last two also are rarely seen. Um, type 5 is a uh, mesoporous, if you will, version of the type 3 where very little gas interaction occurs. And then as we build pressure, we start having some adsorption into 
some larger pores, and then hysteresis as the desorption occurs. And then type 6 isotherm is just a layer by layer adsorption on a uniform non porous surface. And again, as I said, not very frequently seen. So, what kind of data can I obtain from this? Well, as I mentioned, the isotherm is the raw data. Again, the volume of gas adsorbed on the Y versus pressure, normally expressed as P over P0 on the X. And we can use different ranges of this pressure axis uh, to gather different characteristics of a material for calculation. Surface area can be calculated using models from Langmuir or BET, multipoint and single point. Micropore volume and area can be calculated using T-plot or MP method. Uh, micropore size distribution, um, these are examples of some of the models, Horvath, Kawazoe, and Dubinin. Meso and macropore size, area, and volume distributions can be calculated from what's called BJH um, model, and this is for the three people who developed this, Barrett, Joyner, and Halinda. And essentially, they uh, combined thickness equations to look at the buildup of adsorbed layers on the surface of pores, and then the Kelvin equation to calculate the condensed gas in the core of the pores. About 30 or so years ago, density functional theory was pioneered for gas adsorption to calculate area and pore volume distribution. Prior to that, it was too calculation intensive to be even done on computers of, of the day. But of course, as computer technology has advanced, this has become easier to do. But it requires a model or a kernel of that type of material to be able to extract um, extract data to calculate the density functional theory area and pore volume distribution. But one of the attractions of that particular technique is, unlike other techniques where you can do micropore pores or mesopore pores or surface area, you can get everything from micropore to macropores within density functional theory. And then finally, one can calculate total pore volume when the sample is completely saturated with gas. So the most common types, I talked about some that were rare, but the most common types of isotherms are type 1, 2, and 4. In general, these represent microporous, macroporous, and mesoporous materials respectively. For surface area, the critical area of the isotherm is the development of the multilayer adsorption, as we've talked about. So micropore filling at low pressures, as we mentioned, buildup of gas on the surface, higher energy sites filling, uh, filling in the monolayer, and then development of multilayer adsorption, and then filling of macropores. And the same with type four, buildup of gas on the surface, multilayer adsorption, and then in this case, filling of the mesopores. In this presentation, we're gonna focus on surface area calculations. So early work, by Langmuir in 1919 on charcoal indicated that gas molecules adsorb in only a single layer, after which negligible adsorption occurred. And this was true for the materials he was looking at because they were primarily microporous materials, but it doesn't apply to all materials, obviously. So Brunauer, Emmett, and Teller were three scientists who actually only worked together very briefly, and in 1938, theorized that multilayer adsorption was more the norm and developed the formula to explain this phenomenon. Data is taken from the isotherm in the linear region where multilayer adsorption takes place, as we've talked about, and this range in relative pressure is typically between 0 0.05 and 0 0.3. By the way, Brunauer also was the first person to assign designations to type one through five isotherms back in those days. And in the late 1950s, uh, commercialization of instrumentation to the marketplace so that scientists around the world could collect data in a reproducible manner and compare experiments uh, became prevalent. Prior to that, everyone had their own home-built rigs that were usually glass rack apparatus that uh, I was told by someone who did this back many years ago that before you could be a material scientist, you had to become an expert glass blower so that you could build your own instrument. So again, kind of an oversimplification, but adsorption layers, the ideal situation where we want to have a monolayer, um, and the type 1 isotherm would kind of indicate this, 
And then in reality, something that really happens more often is the first layer doesn't complete the monolayer. The second layer adds a little bit more, but is much lower energy absorption. And as we go out to the third and ith layer, much, much lower energy absorption takes place. So the, the revelation that Brunauer, Emmett, and Teller came up with was this equation, at least this is the linear form of it. And volume uh, VA is volume adsorbed of gas, P, the absolute pressure, the P0 saturation pressure, as we've discussed, and then V sub M, what we're calculating, the monolayer gas volume from this information. Also in the BET equation is a C value called the BET C constant, which is related to the heat of adsorption. Now this linear form Y equals MX plus B, we have the intercept and the slope present here as obvious, the X value and the Y value is sometimes called BET transformation for the Y value. So here we have a plot and a linear regression of three data points for a multi-point BET analysis. Again, using the linear form of the equation, the BET transformation on the y-axis, relative pressure on the x-axis, our <clears throat> y-intercept, y over v sub mc, and our slope, c minus 1 over v sub mc. This allows us to uh, calculate that from this regression analysis. So our slope and our intercept, combined with a little algebraic magic, I can then determine my monolayer volume is equal to one over the slope plus intercept. Also, the C value is equal to one plus slope divided by intercept. So I gotta get to surface area now. How do I do that? Well, the total surface area under test, which is the total amount of sample in my sample tube. Um, for instance, if I had a 10 square meter per gram sample and I had a 10th of a gram of sample in my sample tube, I would have one meter squared in my sample tube. So the total surface area under test is calculated by taking the monolayer volume from the VET solution, multiplying it times Avogadro's number, the cross-sectional area of a gas molecule, which for nitrogen is 0.162 square nanometers, and then dividing that by the molar volume gives us this total surface area under test. Then to determine the specific surface area, which is meters squared per gram, I take that total surface area under test and divide it by the mass of the sample. So again, in this case, my one meter squared total surface area under test divided by 0.1 grams would give me 10 square meters. Now, one of the things that's really nice about the BET equation and is very, very often quite applicable is creating what's called a single point calculation, which can allow us to collect meaningful information, particularly a good thumbprint or fingerprint of our material extremely rapidly. And so when the C value is very large, meaning we have a relatively high heat of adsorption or affinity for the surface to adsorb the gas molecules, one over V sub M C approaches zero, meaning the Y intercept is very close to zero. So the regression analysis can be forced through the origin without substantial error or change to slope. Likewise, C minus one is almost C when C is very large. Thus C minus one over V sub M C can be reduced to one over V sub M. So this simplifies our equation to volume adsorbed, knowing the pressures, and knowing the monolayer volume is quite easily to calculate with one single point. So how do we do all this? Well, we take advantage of these van der Waals forces. We repair a sample by removing these adsorbed molecules, thus re-energizing the surface of the material which we wish to measure. And next, we perform a controlled adsorption of gas on the surface to measure it. And what you see here is the Hariba SA9603 multipoint instrument. So Preparation for a sample. Talked to, said we would talk about this. Preparation of a sample requires time, elevated temperature, and a clean environment in the sample tube itself. And some notes here, a, a rule of thumb 
is to apply a temperature which will not change the structure of the material but will drive off its absorbed water and vapor. So ideally, certainly above uh, 100 degrees C. And you should be able to find a temperature if your sample takes one hour to degas and you determine a temperature that's appropriate, you should be able to degas that sample for one hour or three hours or 12 hours and it shouldn't change the structure of the material. The second note is if people do not have any idea what prep temperature to use, a general rule of thumb is to determine the melting point of the material if possible and never apply more than 50% of that uh, temperature. And also with pharmaceuticals, the active pharmaceutical ingredients or some excipients uh, can't usually be degassed at very high temperatures, much above ambient, maybe 30 degrees, maybe 50 degrees C, um, which means they take a little bit longer in time to clean up. So how does preparation work? So typically a sample is placed in a clean sample tube, and you see here we have a U-shaped tube and a powdered bed at the bottom. The sample tube's connected to the instrument and a source of heat. Heat's then applied, in this case using a heating mantle, and while being heated, a source of dry gas flows through the sample tube. As the temperature rises, the molecules absorbed on the surface are heated. They begin to move more rapidly and overcome weak van der Waals forces. Then as they break free from the surface of the sample material, they're swept away by the flowing gas. So that leaves the van der Waals energy again unsatisfied. Sometimes this is referred to as being activated. And it's important that the sample remain unexposed to atmosphere as much as possible after this preparation uh, before the analysis is performed. So let's talk a little bit about the types of gas adsorption instruments. Um, with a volumetric instrument, a manifold for dosing gas onto the sample must be calibrated, which means that it must also be maintained and recalibrated at regular intervals for data quality. And then for every test, the volume below the valve to the sample must be measured and stored. With these two values, the value of the volume of the manifold and the volume below the valve in the sample tube, this can be a derivation essentially of the ideal gas law where P1 V1 equals P2 V2. So gas is dosed into the manifold, it's equilibrated, the pressure is recorded, and then the valve to the sample opens and gas is dosed onto the sample. Based upon these known volumes that are previously stored, a predicted pressure drop should occur. However, gas is adsorbed and the pressure falls below that which would be predicted if no adsorption had taken place. So from this difference in pressure, a volume of gas adsorbed can be calculated. This process must be repeated iteratively, depending on the material, its surface area, the number of data points to be collected and so on, it could be repeated possibly hundreds of times. With a dynamic system, with a much simpler approach, a gas mixture flows into the instrument. As it flows across one side of a thermal conductivity detector, or TCD, it generates a signal. The gas flows across the sample, which is immersed in liquid nitrogen, and then flows across the second TCD. As a result of gas adsorption onto the sample surface, a difference in gas concentration produces a voltage difference between the two CTD, oh boy, sorry, between the two TCDs. Um, and this signal is displayed in the instrument software. For each data point, an automated calibration, adsorption, and desorption cycle occurs. And then from each of these desorption peaks, a volume adsorbed is calculated. Finally, with a gravimetric instrument, um, a very small sample is placed in a gravimetric microbalance. The balance is usually enclosed in an environment or chamber where temperature, humidity are controlled, and then humidity typically is changed to control um, um, to permit adsorption to, to occur and collect data points. As the humidity level increases, the sample adsorbs um, liquid from the, the humidity the mass increases and the microbalance measures that change in mass and an isotherm is generated based on change in mass. After reaching high levels of humidity, a reverse process might bring the sample back down in humidity and track those changes which occur. So again, just a quick comparison between the three types, a 
A volume metric requires volume calibration data. It's typically slow stepwise data collection, typically must dose multiple times per data point. It's great for research applications. You can collect many data points. It can be configured to measure extremely low pressure data, for instance, in micropore pore size distribution, but they're very complex designs, so that impacts the cost to purchase and the cost to maintain. The dynamic systems typically extremely fast for single point surface area. Good, it's a good, good tool for in-process control of product. It's an excellent tool for rapid material screening and research applications. So, for example, you have a group that's synthesizing a number of materials um, and you want to be able to give them a thorough characterization on a volumetric instrument. You load one of your samples onto this instrument and realize two hours or three hours down the road that your synthesis didn't work very well and your material is a failure. On the other hand, you could plug it into a, a dynamic system to collect a single point surface area and know pretty quickly in inside of 10 minutes or less whether or not that material is a good candidate to take over and spend more time on your more expensive instrument. It's inexpensive to purchase and also inexpensive to maintain. They're extremely reliable and robust. Um, they also use a quick connect fitting that connects the sample tube to the degas system or the analysis system. And the quick connect disconnect prevents any atmospheric exposure of the sample when it's being transferred. Also, uh, as you saw in that one picture where degas and analysis is all in one box, it's a, it has a very small footprint. The gravimetric system, as I mentioned, uses a microbalance, very small amount of sample. The balance is teared at the start of the analysis. Gas flows in and is adsorbed, the mass increases, and is measured by the balance. These are typically more expensive research-grade instruments. They're very popular for application for water or vapor adsorption. So why does Hariba um, promote flowing gas or dynamic systems? Well, as Julie said, I had a few years in the field of gas adsorption prior to joining Hariba, so I, I will say that after more than 30 years with the largest gas adsorption instrument manufacturer in the world, I can assure you that the more valves, transducers, vacuum systems, and controls you have, the higher the cost to purchase, the higher the failure rate, the higher the cost to maintain, the higher the cost to repair, so on and so forth. So in Hariba's world, um, the dynamic flowing gas system is just a very straightforward design. It has a lower cost to purchase. It's very robust and reliable, has very low maintenance cost. It's an extremely fast data collection system. And you have um, excellent, it is excellent for use in production or quality control environments. And as I mentioned, the self-sealing bulkhead fittings help avoid contamination, and it's extremely simple to operate. So let's talk about the measurement. What do we need to do to be able to do this? Well, we have to know the precise mass of the sample, as you saw in the earlier equations to be able, be able to calculate specific surface area, but it has to be the mass after preparation because the sample will lose mass as we're driving off adsorbed water or vapor. So we have to tear um, the empty sample tube and record that, and then a known mass of sample is added. And many times people like to record this mass anyway because once we have prepared the sample and we've weighed it and have this weight loss, it's um, sometimes a good diagnostic to calculate the percent of weight loss and compare, if I'm running the same material day in and day out, compare this percent of weight loss to make sure that my data is reasonable. If I have a, typically a 5% weight loss and then I have a sample where I have a 12% weight loss, I have some suspicion about something going on different there with that particular material. So, then we prepare the sample or degas it as we've talked about. And then after the analysis is complete, we weigh the sample tube to determine the sample mass. So this is the post analysis sample plus tube weight minus the sample tube tear weight, which provides us the degas sample weight. So uh, again, Hariba's approach, dynamic gas alternative. What you see here is the SA9600 series of surface area instruments. We have two models of instruments, and within each model, we have two options. The 9601 comes with two degas ports and an analysis port. It has a built-in microcomputer for controlling the instrument, 
So everything you need to conduct the test is right here in this one cabinet, very small footprint cabinet, or you can connect it to a PC and run it from a PC with software. It's configured, can be configured at the 9601 as a single point instrument, or with the addition of mass flow controllers, it can be configured to perform multi-point BET analysis. Likewise, the 9603 is built with three degas stations and three analysis stations. Again, same microcomputer or same interface to a PC can be used. And the 9603 can be configured to do simultaneous single point analysis on three stations, or again, with the addition of mass flow controllers to be able to perform multi-point surface area analysis on all three stations. So what's actually happening when we perform an analysis? Analysis is initiated from the PC software or an integrated computer, and gas starts to flow across the sample. Here you see um, a plot of what is normally shown on the screen uh, on the software, where you see the baseline of gas flowing across the sample, um, which is expressed as voltage on the x-axis versus time on the y-axis. So we establish a stable baseline, and then the instrument injects one cc of nitrogen into the stream of gas. And this addition of nitrogen causes a peak to come down like this. And then as that nitrogen flows past the detectors, we're back to our normal mixture of gas and we have a baseline signal. At this point, the doer raises and the sample cools. And as it does, the sample starts to adsorb nitrogen, which depletes nitrogen from the flow of gas and generates this peak. As the sample becomes equilibrated at this point, and is adsorbing no, no further nitrogen, the signal comes back to baseline. In other words, our gas mixture is back to the same it was at the beginning. And at this point, the doer is lowered, and now we have excess nitrogen coming off the sample into the flow, generating this peak. And then as all the nitrogen gas comes off, we come back to baseline again. So this rapid desorbing gas provides a very nice integratable peak versus the adsorbing peak. And we use this to calculate a single point analysis. If we were going to do a multi-point analysis, this process would be repeated from two to five times if you wanted to have multi-point data. So you see on the previous slide, the progression of a single, uh, typical single point analysis, but Here's examples of what the gas flow data might look like if we were to compare a relatively small surface area uh, material under test to one that was relatively large surface area. Um, note that in both cases, the calibration peak is actually the same amplitude. It's just a different scale factor on the screens because in the small surface area case, we have very, very small amount of uh, nitrogen uh, uptake and desorption and in the larger surface area, obviously, much substantially higher. In a multi-point BET example, we see gas flow data, which would result from three points here. So we have the baseline, the calibration, the adsorption, and desorption for each of these points. But we're changing the concentration of gas for each of these points. And in so doing, when we change the concentration of gas, uh, the mass flow controllers are adjusted, we have a peak generated here and here, which are ignored by the software. So again, a linear regression, a typical three-point regression analysis um, from the volume and sorb data using the BET equation. The quality of the data can be examined by um, looking at the correlation coefficient, or R squared, to determine if the regression analysis is a good fit to the data. And a value of 0.999 or higher is deemed very good. And in this case, we have a C constant of 145 and a surface area for this material about 11.36. So here we're showing results for three aliquots of a commercially available calcium carbonate analyzed three times each for single point analysis as well as multi-point analysis. So we have three samples, one, two, three, each tested three times and then statistics for each sample, average standard deviation coefficient of variance for each of the three samples, 
and then grand totals for all nine tests here. The same with the multipoint analysis, three samples, three tests each, individual statistics, and statistics for the total. And here we're looking um, at three aliquots of a commercially available kaolin, analyzed three times each for single point analysis as well as multi-point analysis. So again, the same statistics as you saw in the previous slide of three sample tubes, three tests each, and the statistics for single point, three sample tubes, three tests each, and the statistics for multi-point analysis. So some other materials, just as an example, we work with lots and lots of different materials, but these are some commercially available ones that um, certainly we don't wanna put up customer data, but these are commercially available um, materials that you can see single point and multi-point analysis for alumina, bentonite, calcium hydroxide, graphite, hydroxyapatite, and kaolinite. You can see a couple of things from this. One, that the differences between single point and multi-point are not significant particularly if you're just looking for thumbprints, um, this difference is really insignificant. And secondly, you can see the wide range of surface areas that we can analyze with this instrument. This isn't inclusive. We can actually measure wider ranges than this. But in this example, we go from about six square meters up to about 180 square meters. So that's, uh, that's what I've got. I thank you very much for attending. And Hope you found this helpful to you, and I guess I'll turn it back over to Julie. <laughs> Thank you so much, John. That was a really good presentation. No one knew that that was your debut. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a few questions that came in, though. Are you ready? I guess I will do my best. All right, awesome. Well, question one that came in. You talked about degassing by flow, flowing gas. Um, I've heard of vacuum degassing. How is it different? Um, well, that's a good question. So we do degassing by flowing gas. Um, I talked about that and showed the uh, example of our um, flowing gas system. In um, a flowing gas system, you're a bit more energetically um, preparing the sample. There we go. You're a bit more energetically preparing the sample because we're flowing gas through the sample bed and out. So as we're heating the sample and releasing these adsorbed vapors, water, what have you, um, there's a good bit more energy being applied in terms of the flow of gas. It's diffusing through the bed and it's causing these um, contaminants to be swept out of the sample tube quite rapidly. In a vacuum system, certainly you can do a very good job, but it's a bit more passive. You're pull, pulling a vacuum or applying a vacuum to the sample as you're heating it, so you're 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 boiling off, if you will, the adsorbed water and vapors, but they're in that tube and they have to be swept out. And that's you know a statistical thing where you're reducing the number of molecules every minute by by a certain substantial amount, but it does take a good bit of time to remove all of the contaminants from the sample tube. Also, this is a self-contained flowing preparation system. There are other flowing systems where you have a, not a U-shaped tube, but a regular test tube with sample in the bottom, and you insert a flow tube down into the throat of the sample tube and push the flow tube into the powder bed and then flow gas through the powder bed that way. Well, that's nice, but if you, depending on your material, you have to then place a stopper in the top of the sample tube and leave it slightly open so that air can flow back out the top of the sample tube into your lab. It's not self-contained and exhausted as it is here. So you, you give up some control of the environment a little bit in that type of flowing and in vacuum, typically it's just going to be a little bit slower um, and not as aggressive in terms of the uh, speed of preparation of a flowing gas experiment. Thank you, John. How do we evaluate data quality for gas adsorption measurements? And part two to that question is, how can we optimize the measurements for poor size analysis? Well, for surface area, data quality is certainly uh, evaluated by looking at the correlation coefficient of a multipoint um, linear regression, better data fitting to the 
points gives you assurance that you've got a, a good model from the ET. In terms of pore size, how can you optimize the pore size analysis? Well, that's um, that's kind of a difficult question to answer because again, it kind of depends on the range of pores that you have. You may, uh, for meso and macro pores, a, a very historically well known and used model, as I mentioned, is BJH. And these are typically applied anytime you have pores from two nanometers, uh, two nanometers and up. Um, so meso and macropore pore sizes. If you have micropores, there are so many different models for micropore pore size distribution. That's that's a <laughs> that would be a whole nother webinar to talk about how to optimize pore size distribution data reduction models, to be quite honest. So I our contact info, which is labinfo at hariba.com. Um, I know some of these questions really depends on the sample and you know the particle challenge that you have. So feel free to email us and we can explain probably through more of a one-on-one -on -one meeting or you know in an email. So um, why is 0.05 to 0.3 the preferred range um, used for surface area calculation? Well, so this is the area we talked about before where we have the multi-layer adsorption take place. After we have built up the surface of the material, this is the optimum range where we have this linear region of the isotherm. And so this typically is occurring between about 0.05 and 0.3 relative pressure. Now, one of the things that comes into play, particularly when you're working with very microporous materials, and, and, and in reality, micropore uh, for BET is, is not really a good fit, but that doesn't stop people from using it all the time because you can still establish a fingerprint with it. But if you're working with really relatively highly microporous materials, actually this range may shift down to lower values, somewhere from 0.01 to 0.05, to be able to get a reasonable result from micropore pore size distribution when you're trying to apply BET to it. Thank you very much. Roughly how long, and the next question is, roughly how long would a typical single and also multi-point analysis take? And then part two of that question is, if you have data for dynamic, dynamic versus volumetric systems to compare accuracy and repeatability. If you had data with dynamic and volumetric, how would the how would the accuracy compare? Is that what the question is? Right. And also part one of the question is how long does it usually take right. for right. the right. analysis? So single point um, analysis for most materials, of course, you've got to prepare the sample, but the analysis itself, probably well under 10 minutes, maybe under five or six minutes. Um, very, very rapid. For a multi-point analysis, again, it depends on the material, but a multi-point analysis might take 30 minutes, somewhere in that range, to be able to collect uh, data points that were meaningful enough to be able to get a BET analysis from. In terms of comparing accuracy between dynamic and volumetric, I don't know that there is a substantial disadvantage or advantage to one or the other when we're talking about measuring surface area. Um, again, you're talking about the analysis time and the complexity of the analysis, but um, in terms of the quality of data, you're going to be able to measure the same result essentially um, on, if you took the same material and put it in front of a volumetric instrument or a dynamic instrument, you should be able to obtain the same results quite easily. Thank you. How does porosity measurements differ from overall surface area? Well, so again, um, I guess this slide is, is applicable to that question. Again, surface area we're collecting in this linear region. And if we're talking about mesopore, or micropore, or, or macropores, um, sorry, macropores, micropores or mesopores, you've got a different region of the isotherm where you're collecting these data. You have a tremendous amount of uptake occurring in these regions versus a linear region here where you're just building layer upon layer on the surface. So in each of these cases, a substantial uptake is occurring because of the pore filling. And again, the difference there then becomes the model that you have to apply to do the calculations for the pore size distribution. 
Thank you, John. So I kind of want to draw the attention to the app note um, AN222, metal powder properties. So that app note will show you the repeatability of the, the SA9600. Um, so there, there's valuable data to be seen as well as the um, standard co uh, coefficient of variations that will show you how repeatable um, the system is. So that kind of brings us to the next question, which is why BET and what influences the test so as to minimize variation in results? So I, I think this person is asking what influence the variation in results? So for instance, in some of the results I showed, the small variations that you saw, I guess is what we're talking about. Um, well, a number of things, of course, preparation and weighing can have something to do with it. We've got different sample tubes. There are small differences between, you know, port to port differences on a multi-port instrument that you might see slight calibration differences. And this would be true of a multi-point, a multi-port uh, volumetric system as well. Sample handling um, post analysis, of course, could have something to do with it. Um, Again, we want to make sure we're not exposing the sample to atmospheric gas because we uh, have an impact on the uh, surface area, of course, when we do that. So that's that's an important piece of it as well. And of course, if we have a relatively high surface area material and we um, are trying to weigh it after analysis, if we're not careful and we don't do it relatively soon after the analysis, or sometimes people will take a sample tube and leave it open to atmosphere for five minutes while they're doing something else, well, it's all absorbing water vapor that whole time from the uh, laboratory environment, and the mass is changing very rapidly. There's some materials you can have in a sample tube, you can put it on a balance and you can watch the mass just constantly increase as it absorbs. So these are all things that can affect the accuracy. Thank you. And last question, um, when an instrument doesn't have the bulkhead fittings, that you talked about. How do you avoid contamination? So that's a good question. What you end up having to do is, um, again, you have a straight sample tube essentially, and you have a, usually a stopper that goes in the top of the sample tube. So when you are finished um, preparing it by vacuum or flow, you have to remove it from the degas device and very quickly place the stopper in the sample tube and then move it to the instrument and remove the stopper. And then you push the sample tube through a, uh, a nut and ferrule into the um, bulkhead of the manifold and tighten it there. But each time you do this, you're exposing the sample and the tube to atmospheric gas. So this is one of the nice things about having these quick connects on our sample tubes. Got it. Cool. So I want to honor everyone's time and thank you, John, for the excellent talk. On behalf of our particle group, thank you so much for attending. We will see you at our next webinar, which is in 2023, January 26, where Avika will be discussing about aggregation. So make sure you join our newsletter. Um, anything else that you want to add before we wrap up, John? No, I just want to thank everybody again for their time and attention. I hope it's been helpful. And, you know, if you need to rewatch and learn anything, obviously you'll have that opportunity. And I welcome anyone to contact me with any questions they may have that I can help with. Perfect. Thank you so much, John. And thanks, everyone. We'll see you next year. Bye-bye. Bye now.